16 captive flights, one glide flight, and 10 powered flights. It was all pretty much routine. We, North American that is, went up there to check out the aircraft, to check out the systems, to see how she handled and whether or not she'd meet the specs before we turned her over to the Air Force. But you'll have to go up to NASA's Flight Research Center at Edwards to find out how the actual test programs worked. Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert in California. This is where the X-15 story comes together. For here is where test flights of all high-speed research aircraft since the X-1 have taken place. Like all the programs conducted here, the X-15 flight research project had a simple basis. A series of progressive steps to higher speeds and to higher altitudes. But each step, each flight itself, had a more immediate purpose than simply to gain more speed or altitude. And each flight was carefully planned to make the most effective use of this aircraft as a research vehicle or a tool. Paul Bickle, director of NASA's Flight Research Center. Each flight provided new information or confirmed one tunnel or theoretical data on the characteristics of an airplane performing in a very advanced flight regime. Each flight grew out of one that had already taken place and led to another still to come. But of course, the X-15 flight program really began in the simulator months before the first airplane was delivered to us. Joe Walker, Chief NASA Edwards research pilot, physicist, and pilot of a long list of research aircraft. Practice or planning in the simulator is the beginning of every flight that's ever been made in the X-15. All pilots assigned to the project first become familiar with the handling characteristics and timing of the X-15 on any given mission in the flight simulator. It's been good insurance for all of us. One of the X-15 pilots who has spent many hours in the flight simulator is NASA's Milton Thompson. Here, Thompson flies a practice mission under normal procedure with pilot engineer John McKay working as his flight planner. In a nearby room where the analog computer is housed, the activity in the cockpit can be monitored on closed circuit TV. The pilot's control movements and the airplane's simulated response are checked on a plotter by the flight planner, who will monitor the actual flight from the NASA Edwards Control Center on the ground. The pilot's inputs may also be monitored and recorded by other instruments. Variations from the planned mission are then simulated, so the pilot will learn to recognize their effects on the aircraft. For example, he may get a problem involving changes in stability. These changes are fed by the computer to his cockpit instruments. The pilot reads the changes and makes control inputs to bring the aircraft back to normal. His response is monitored and evaluated. The pilot also goes through what is called trouble school, where failure of one or more of the X-15's major systems is simulated. Again, his reaction is monitored. Each pilot gets further practice by making a number of flights in a modified F-104 aircraft. He flies over his upcoming X-15 flight course to establish geographic checkpoints and key altitudes in the landing pattern. All flights are made over the high range, a network of ground tracking stations stretching from Wendover, Utah, 485 miles south to Edwards in California. The range consists of a master station at Edwards and radar stations at Ely, Nevada and at Beatty. The flight corridor is 50 miles wide and it contains a number of dry lake beds where emergency landings can be made. Two kinds of powered flights are made over the high range. One, a ballistic type, high altitude run up to and even above 250,000 feet. And two, a high speed run made at a lower altitude, usually 60 to 70,000 feet. During his practice flights in the F-104, 
the pilot must also familiarize himself with the timing and positioning for an X-15 landing at both primary and alternate landing sites. And he makes practice landings using predetermined settings that can simulate the low lift drag ratio of the X-15. Nothing is left to chance in the air or on the ground. These precautions paid off during one particular flight when it was discovered the X-15 pilot could only get 30% power and would have to make an emergency landing. Ready to launch. Five, four, three, two, one. Uh, that's a good light. That's a good light. Hello on thrust. Give us the chamber reading. Got 12 degrees. Okay. Chamber pressure. Pressure Push your throttle up and give us chamber pressure. Uh, we don't have chamber pressure, about 200. Roger, you got the full throttle? Up front. You're running at 30%. 30%? How are we going, Mark? Roger, uh, you're going by Mud Lake. It looks like a landing at Mud Lake. Roger. Uh, looks from the smoke down there like there's a very tiny bit of wind from uh, perhaps south and a little bit east, isn't it? Yeah. Wrecked though it seemed to be, both the aircraft and the pilot survived to continue with the program. This was one of only three major accidents, all non-fatal, that have occurred in more than 120 flights with the X-15. A remarkable record of reliability. In February 1964, the plane that crashed on Mud Lake only a few months before came rolling out of the North American plant with a new designation, the X-15A2. This modified version was rebuilt for flight to Mach 8, eight times the speed of sound, where the airflow temperature rises to 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The new X-15 had a new heat-resistant protective coating, a new inertial guidance system, a longer fuselage, external tanks to carry more fuel for longer flights, and lengthened landing gear. All the while this new X-15 was being built, tests were continuing with the other two aircraft, and they continue today. For every flight, the procedure is essentially the same. Every phase carefully planned, every second of actual flight time mapped out in advance. That way, every man involved knows exactly what his job will be from the beginning to the end of the flight. Hours of preparation, weeks of planning, months of study, whole years of research. All this goes with the X-15 each time she leaves the hangar for another flight. For after all, no matter how many flights have been made before, each new test will probe a little deeper into the unknown. She is a research tool, this sleek black aircraft, carrying a host of instruments, gauges and recorders to explore the unknown. And every second of her time in flight must be carefully charted. That's why at the Ely High Range Station at Beatty, at Edwards, sensitive antenna watch and listen to each flight. That's why the pilot's heartbeat never really leaves the ground. And that's why in each control room on the ground, the plotting board is carefully watched for any unplanned deviation, for any unlooked for change in the pilot's reactions or in the behavior of the aircraft. Position and velocity computers, telemetry receivers and monitors, data receiving and recording equipment, communications receivers and transmitters, they all go into action at the beginning of every flight. In NASA 1, the project men stand by, alert for any possible trouble in the flight while flight surgeons prepare to watch the pilot's physiological response, his pulse, his body temperature, heart action, respiration rate, all of this will be telemetered to the ground. Then, as always, when time for takeoff draws near, attention focuses on the man chosen to fly the mission. Because of this, the X-15 pilot becomes, in effect, the symbol for the entire research team the one man who represents all the others who have worked so long and so hard 
to make the project a success. And it is a proud record of accomplishment they've achieved. They have designed and built an aircraft that could be piloted into space and flown back safely to a controlled landing on Earth. They have accumulated important data on aerodynamic heating at hypersonic speeds. They've learned about stability and control of aircraft during flight in near space and re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere. And perhaps most important of all, they have dramatized the potential of piloted high-performance aircraft in a space environment at a time when much of the world's gaze was turned toward orbital flight. The X-15 research project has long since achieved its original goals. The aircraft has been flown successfully more than 120 times, and although setting new records wasn't its purpose, it has set a few along the way. Altitude, 67 miles. Speed, Mach 6, 4,104 miles an hour. The highest and fastest a winged aircraft has ever flown. Today, the X-15 moves on to further accomplishment. But now the thoroughbred has become a workhorse, carrying a heavy payload of instruments, undertaking studies of the near space environment possible before only with unmanned satellite and rocket-borne probes. There are many people who should share the credit for the continuing success of the X-15 research project. But perhaps they will understand if we seem to focus on those who have actually flown the many research aircraft since the X-1. By saluting these courageous men, we also pay homage to all the others who have helped us move step by step, deeper and deeper, into the unknown outskirts of space.